Welcome back to another tutorial. Today, we'll be making Noodle by Martin Magni. This is a game where you play as this noodly creature and slither along the level without hitting anything. In a way, this is basically a modified and simplified version of Snake, which I also made a tutorial of a couple of years ago. Anyways, let's start doing a remake in Fancade. Okay, so for this game, we only need to make two blocks. One for the body for Noodle and the other for the walls. So let's go ahead and do just that. Now that we have created all of our assets, we should construct the playground of the Noodle. Let's keep it simple for now and create a giant square border with our wall block. And I'm going to make mine 21 by 21. Then, I'll grab the body and kinda eyeball it in the middle. And I'm just going to check if its distance from the walls is the same throughout. Next, I'm going to use a script block and paste it to where our noodle is, and we'll be putting all of our code inside this container. The first thing we have to do is to initialize the game. We'll take our body block and assign it to our variable, and we'll also be setting its position. But before that, let's head over to a blank level and place a block. If we get its position and inspect it, notice how all of its values end with 0.5. If we duplicate this and check its position, their values also end with 0.5. This implies that both of these blocks are snapped into a grid and they are spaced apart by three blocks. The general pattern for this grid is that every coordinate ends with 0.5. Also, here's a little tip. If this get position block isn't connected to anything, it will output the location of itself. Let's bring a script block, turn it into a custom block and copy the position code. You probably noticed that we can't connect this into the actual block because it's a script block. Therefore, it can only convert this pink arrow into an input wire. But you don't need to worry, we can just leave it as it is. If you remember the tip earlier, a get position block not attached to anything outputs its own position. However, since it's inside the script block, it will output the position of the script block instead. If we press play and check the values at the bottom, you can see that our x and z values have a 0.4375 at the end, while our y value has a 0.1875 at the end. Since the block is placed inside the level, it is also snapped into another grid, wherein the pattern is that every coordinate ends with 0.4375. However, this grid does not align with our previous grid for the regular blocks. Let's return to the main level. We want to set the position of the noodle to be where our script block is, but how do we snap it into a grid like a regular block? To do that, we'll need to get its position, round down all of our values, and add an offset of 0.5. So, regardless of whatever the vector position is, it will always convert it into some integer plus 0 0.5, which snaps it. To round down a number, we can use the floor block from the math section. Now that we've assigned the place position, Let's also keep track of it using a variable. Then, we need to set the visibility of the noodle to true, so that we can actually see it on the level. Let's now set up the camera. We will want to place it at the center of our level, as well as have a distance far enough to show the entirety of our square. You can go ahead and do it manually, but if you want to make multiple levels, this can get very tedious real quick adjusting the position and range for every single level, so I'll show you a simple chunk of code to automatically get those values for you. And for this, we'll be utilizing the get size block from the objects folder. As the name suggests, this block outputs the size of an object. But if we leave the input untouched, it will output the size of the world. What does it mean? Well, the get size block has two outputs, min and max. In this case, min refers to the bottom left corner of the world, while max refers to the top right corner of the world. In other words, they locate the farthest points of the level. To get the center of the world, we'll simply find the average of these two positions. We'll add these vectors together and scale them by 0.5. For the range, we'll be taking the distance between the two vectors, and since they are the farthest points of the level, this value is the highest distance you could possibly have inside this area. And if we multiply this by, say, 4, then it should show everything in the border. And for the rotation, let's set the x value to 90 to have a top-down view. And if we press play, you can see that the camera is situated in the middle as well as the player, and the distance is just right. Finally, let's change the angle of our light source until we have something that looks good enough. 
The next thing we have to worry about is the movement of our player. Let's break down how we'll manage to implement this. We will want to have the noodle move towards the direction it's facing, so we'll be keeping track of our place rotation to accommodate for that very reason. The noodle will also rotate clockwise or counterclockwise depending on whether the player is holding the screen or not. We'll also make use of variables to determine the move speed and turn speed of our noodle. We'll take the place position and add some vector value to it, which will also be adjusted using P, the place rotation, for it to move forward. We'll bring in a new variable and plug it into the Z position of the make vector block, allowing us to control how fast we'd like the noodle to move. Let's also set its rotation according to P. Afterwards, let's update the values of our variables. We'll set the initial value of move speed at the start of the game, and I'm going to have it around 0.2. And if we press play, you can see that the player is now moving forward, but we still need to apply some rotation. We'll set a direction based on whatever the turn speed is, however, we want the player to be able to change directions. So let's grab a touch sensor and change the value of tear whenever the player is touching the screen. Since we want it to go the other way, we can simply use the negate block to invert our value. For instance, if tear is set to 1, holding the screen will change to negative 1. Let's also choose the value for turn speed, which I'll set to 5. Finally, we'll update our place rotation by using the combine block to adjust it based on the direction. And if we press play, our noodle is now revolving and pressing the screen reverses its rotation. Now let's create the body of our noodle. You might say, oh, that's easy, I just need to clone the body and place it to wherever our player is, and you know what, let's go ahead and do just that. If we press play, it might seem like everything is working fine, but let's bring in an spec block and have the advanced mode turned on. If we toggle that, you can see the available space in our project in terms of custom blocks, script space, and objects created. You can see that our objects are at 1%, which seems alright to me. But let's restart the game and play for a few more seconds. And if we toggle this value again, our objects are at 10%. It's definitely larger than before, but what's the big deal with it? Well, since the game is creating an object in every frame, we will effectively reach 600 objects in around 10 seconds. And that's a lot of blocks. The more objects created inside a level, the slower the game's performance will be over time, and eventually it will not handle the amount of blocks and the game will simply run into an error. So how do we fix this issue? We'll set up a timer to only spawn a block every X amount of frames. And for that, we'll be using a modulo block. Let's set the number to 3, and now this should only run every third frame. The next thing on our list is to check for collision, and for this, we'll be using a raycast, but we need to talk about how we'll position it. You might think that all we have to do is to place it in the middle and go forward, but what about the area at both the left and right side of the player? Well, let's just add two more raycasts, but... What about the area in between? Well, let's start again from scratch. We'll start from the left side and have it go forward and to the right. You might think that this is all we need, but this only checks the right side of the player. So what about the left? Let's have another raycast coming from the right side and have it go forward and to the left. Now, this should be able to detect anything in front of the noodle. We'll have a raycast and we'll actually start from the place position so we'll obviously add some adjustments to that. It will also be rotated towards the place direction. For the offsets, we'll be using variables to make it easier to modify them. V1 is to shift the start point while V2 is the raycast direction. Let's also duplicate these variables, connect it to our code, and negate the X values. Before we continue, let's briefly talk about the execution order. The execution order determines which script should be ran first. In FanCade, it generally goes left to right, top to bottom. Let's take a look at this photo. How do you think the order is gonna go? Well, we'll start from the one with P1. You might think that the next in the line is the one with P2, but since this code is connected to the create object, it will actually execute that first. Once the object is created and assigned to a list, then we continue with P2. However, since P2 is also connected to the create object, it will run that code again. What you see here is a wire split. 
Making use of wire splits to effectively cut down on the number of skip blocks you use can be very helpful, especially in optimizing your code. Let's go ahead and plug these foibles to our Raycast. I will also temporarily play a sound effect to test if our code is working. And it works! The game triggers the sound whenever the Raycast hits something. Let's set a boolean to true to stop the game, modify the sound used to something more appropriate like hit, and add a loose block. Now, the player can lose, but they can still move. All we need to do to fix this problem is to have an if condition that checks for stop and connect all of our code to it. That way, it disables everything once a noodle comes across an obstacle. Next, let's set up the scoring system for the game. We'll change the mode to longest time so our player has to survive for as long as possible. If we simply connect the frame block to our score input, you can see that it works, but we're not utilizing the two numbers at the end. To fix this, we need to divide it by 60. And now, we're pretty much done with the game. I'll just add some comments, as well as organize my script to be more readable, and you can also take this time to make more levels and go wild with assigning them. For instance, this second level I'm making is a little maze for a noodle to navigate. You can also globalize the speed variables and customize it based on the level that you're in. And there you have it, we have successfully created a simple game of Noodle. I hope you learned a lot with this tutorial, and as always, all the code will be posted in the GitHub link below. Anyways, I'll see you in the next one.